Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to this exclusive at ITV Networks. Beloved viewers, on the 15th of August this year, coinciding with the 7th of Shawwal 1434, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala claimed the soul of a great man, a man who left a great legacy, Dr. Abdurrahman As-Sumayt. Uh, we have in studio with us Hafiz Imran Chunara, the National Director of Africa Muslims Agency, Direct Aid International, who's going to share with us a live in tri a tribute based on the life of this great man. Hafiz Imran, welcome to the studios. Shukran, Abdul Rahman. Tell us about the history, um, the background to Dr. Abdul Rahman al Naturally, many people would know about his work, especially in the latter years in the globalized world we live in. But I think we're interested in knowing his origins so that this may serve as an inspiration for all of us. Well, Abdul Rahman, I think uh, a lot of the viewers, especially in South Africa, uh, would know uh, Dr. Abdul Rahman uh, Ibn Hamoud al sumayt where um, he traveled to South Africa many, many times. Uh, they would know him because of the impact he's had in Africa and because of his relationship with many ulama here in South Africa as well, actually. Uh, he's a Kuwaiti national, uh, you know, uh, and uh, when he went to Africa, I think most viewers know this by now, that he went to Africa many years ago, almost 30 years ago now, where he started understanding the need of people in Africa. He started understanding poverty. He understand, started understanding his, his desire to be able to live in Africa and to actually help the people in Africa. And uh, he came to South Africa in that process to see what was happening in the southern part of Africa and actually met a lot of the, the, the Muslims here, of course, at that time. So he's very well known, so to speak. I mean, you know, he passed away, by Allah grant him Jannah, the highest place in Jannah, inshallah. He passed away recently, of course, as you mentioned. And uh, when you look at the news all over the world, all over the world in the Islamic publications, all over the world, whether it's uh, the, 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 the TV media, whether it's radio, whether it's print media, uh, they've been paying tribute to this man. And people from every possible background you could never imagine have been paying tribute to him. And he was known in so many different areas. He was known from the poorest of the poor person or the downtrodden person in the remotest village in Africa to some of the highest people in, in, in you know, the kings and presidents and, you know, whatever you want to call uh, the highest levels of governments in different parts around the world. He was known. And, and that just go, get, again shows, goes to show the impact he had. He had such an amazing impact on that level, but it had such an amazing impact on the lowest level also. And we say lowest level, but let me, let me, I mean, we have no idea of some of the piety of some of the people in Africa and some of the people that this man has touched. So Africa right now, many, many parts of Africa, I was in Malawi just a couple of weeks ago again, and, uh, and you speak to people there who remember Dr. Rahman Sumait, and you'd be surprised. You know, widows will remember him, orphans will remember him. Poor children, poor people, uh, you know, rich people, it doesn't matter. People remember Dr. Abdul Rahman Sumayt. It makes one's mind go back to the prophetic example of Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, where any person, irrespective of their stature, their grounding, their position in society, could relate to him, uh, and speaks of an understanding to him, and speaks of the personal relationship uh, they shared with him. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make it such that this can be one of the many um, lessons we can learn from the life of this great man who has left us. Absolutely. I think it will be important for some of the viewers because most of, most of us know Dr. Abdurrahman Sumayt uh, in his years in Africa, in his relief work. But it would be nice to understand his professional background. And I just want to maybe read a couple of things, for example. I want to get this correct, for example. He was, uh, you know, he served the, on the board of directors as the chairman of the, of the research in Islamic studies, born in Kuwait in 1947. First, he was a qualified doctor specializing in internal diseases and gastroenterology before becoming involved in charity work. So before this, he was already a, a qualified doctor. He graduated initially from the University of Baghdad with a bachelor's degree in medicine and surgery. Then he went on to obtain a diploma in tropical diseases from the University of Liverpool in 1974. Then went on to complete his postgraduate studies specializing in internal diseases and the digestive system at McGill University in Montreal, Canada. And when you think about so he comes from a very rich professional background, firstly. He's, you know, he was an educated person. And he could, in that part of the world where he was born in Kuwait, live the life of luxury. Actually, his wife comes from a very, very wealthy family background, extremely wealthy family background in the Middle East. And when they got married, of course, one thing that really, really impressed me about Dr. Abdurrahman Sumayt was that not only did he give up his professional 
career where he could have been successful at that and doing well at that in, in the Middle East, uh, to be able to live in Africa and to be able to just connect with the people in Africa and promote his, his, his faith and, and wanting to help humanity and uplift the standard of humanity. He, his wife also bought into that vision to the point where she actually led, so to speak, the initiative of she donated every single cent of her wealth. She donated all her inheritance and her wealth completely to wanting to develop the people in Africa. That's what she did. And she also, in the uh, last few years, of course, before he actually got ill, they moved to Madagascar with Dr. Abdurrahman Sumait and wanted to retire in Madagascar, in a remote village in Madagascar, where they were just calling people to Islam and just helping people on the ground there. So that's, uh, this just shows the person behind this man as well is his wife. I'm touched because I see the sentiment of a man with a great dream being backed up by a wife with great vision. Absolutely, absolutely. And I tell you, you know, when you think about it, I think it's important. I want viewers to understand. So he comes from a strong professional background. But then when he came to Africa and he saw this, now all of a sudden he didn't come here just one week to Africa, give some money and leave. Now I'm not saying that that's wrong either. I'm just suggesting that he could have done that. The concept of excellence and really going the extra mile. Absolutely. He decided, no, 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 no. I belong here. And he spent, he would spend sometimes months in Africa. He would get ill. He would, at, his, at the expense of his own health, at the expense of his family time, at the expense of his wealth, obviously, he would spend time in Africa. Many times he would get imprisoned. I mean, a couple of times he, he just survived being shot by, 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 by snipers. When you, and, you know, in some of these African countries, when there's civil war going on, there's tribes fighting each other. You know, some tribe thinks, well, you know, they're not sure what he's there to do. Is he really there to help people or whatever? And, and, and they try to, to attack him. And he survived all of that. Uh, you know, when, when, when the Kuwaiti invasion happened, he was in Kuwait at the time. He got imprisoned at that time. He got tortured at that time in a prison uh, when, that, when the whole process was happening, as most of the world would understand that. And yet he believed strongly, even at the time, he was he's recorded for everything said at the time, that, you know, Allah will know when is my time. And when it is my time, it is my time. And Allah decides when that will happen. Hafiz Imran, I can't allow us to go through this discussion without reflecting on his professional background in a sense of seeing exactly what he studied uh, undergrad as well as postgrad, he had a deep understanding of concepts like malnutrition, which allowed him to tie in his efforts in Africa with a scientific understanding of the challenges faced by the people, Absolutely. coupled with his own experience of, of course. living here. Of course. SubhanAllah, much more to share with regards to the late Dr. Abdurrahman as sumait We're going for a quick break. We'll be back shortly. Africa. We are the children of Africa. Africa. We are the children of Africa. Welcome back to this special tribute to a great man, Dr. Abdurrahman as sumait Allah yarhamu may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continuously fill his qabr with nur and with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's mercy. Beloved viewers, remember that we'll be sharing with you lots of file footage that alhamdulillah we've managed together of his life, of his contribution, of how he physically interacted with people and the projects that he set up throughout Africa and other parts of the world as well. Hafiz Imran, someone of the stature of Dr. Abdurrahman Sumait with work throughout the continent of Africa, with relationship with people, you know, at the highest excellence of management, of governance, of leadership, uh, interacting with people on the ground. People were awestruck by his life, by his approach. Uh, this brings someone to a position where they then receive lots of accolades. What were some of these accolades that he received? Well, Abdurrahman, you know, I think uh, I want to go through some of his uh, accolades. And, you know, he helped, he helped establish and participated in many, many professional and charitable organizations. He was awarded many, many awards uh, around the world uh, for his work and for his work, not only in charitable work, but also in professional work as well, because he continued to do work and research in his professional field as well. For example, he was the founder and chairman of a branch of the Muslim Physician, Physician Society in the U.S. US, United States of America, and Canada in 1976, the East Canada branch. He was a founding member of the Montreal branch of the Muslim Student Society in 1974 to 76. He was a founding member of the Malawi Muslims Committee in Kuwait in 1980 at the time, founding member of Kuwaiti Relief Committee, the founding member again of the International Islamic Charitable Author Charity Authority in Kuwait, a founding member of the International Islamic Council for Call and Relief in Kuwait, member of Charity Rescue Society in Kuwait, a General Secretary of the African Muslims Committee, 1981 to 1999, then Chairman of Darid Aid from 1999 to 2008, member of the Kuwaiti Red Crescent Society in Kuwait, Editor-in-Chief of Al-Kothar Magazine from 1984 until his passing, 
the member of the Council of Trustees of Islamic Call Organization in Sudan, member of the Council of Trustees of Science and Technology University in Yemen, chairman of the Board of Faculty of Education in Zanzibar, chairman of the Board and Faculty of Sharia and Islamic Studies in Kenya, chairman of Charity Work Studies in Center in Kuwait. Now, you see, these are just some of the accolades, some of the awards he received, and some of the participation he had in many, many organizations. But for example, let me give you, a, um, you know, something that I remember very, very vividly. He received a number of years ago a King Faisal Award uh, uh, in Saudi at the time, and he would receive this as a prize money, so to speak, I suppose, as award money. He received what 750,000 riyals at the time. What he decided to do with it, 750,000 riyals, he took every cent and gave it to the work in Africa. He did not take one cent for himself. He took every cent of the 750,000 riyals that he was awarded as a personal award to his work in Africa. That was his now personal money he was giving back to that as, as well. Now, so you look at a person of all these accolades, and in many, many countries around Africa, he was awarded diplomatic status. Because of the work he was doing on the ground, they respected him so much. The Islamic historical narrative brings to mind one personality, that of Umar ibn Abdul Aziz, uh, rahmatullah alayhi, uh, in the sense of being known as the second Umar, of him contributing everything that was his estate uh, to the upliftment of the work he was doing, and also having a spouse in the same way as Dr. Abdurrahman al-Sumayt had, um, that also contributed to his work and contributed all her personal wealth. This is about his work, the acknowledgements, the accolades. But naturally, a man, a human being, is known by virtue of his personal interactions with other human beings. You were fortunate, alhamdulillah, to have interacted with him on many occasions from a young age uh, up until the time when he was in his terminal illness. You visited him, uh, you know, in the hospital. Share with us what it was to be in the presence of Dr. Abdurrahman. Well, alhamdulillah, Abdurrahman, I was fortunate to be, you know, he, when he came to South Africa in 1987 to start African Muslims Agency and Direct Aid International here, he met my late dad at that time, Allah grant him Jannah, inshallah, said, uh, and, and uh, uh, Muhammad Farid Chunara, and encouraged him to start African Muslim Agency here in South Africa. So together they launched African Muslim Agency, Direct Aid International in 1987 here in South Africa. So from then already, as a young boy, I was already around Dr. Abdurrahman, so made a lot. And then he visited because of his now relationship, they became very, very close friends. His relationship with my dad at the time, so he visited South Africa many, many times. They traveled into Africa together many, many times as well. And so we would hear stories. But my personal experiences as a young boy growing up was he would come to our home in, in, in Indonesia, and obviously he, he would eat with us and, and stay with us uh, at lengthy, lengthy, lengthy times. And, uh, you know, of course, as we would do normally, you try to be hospitable, so you try to make more than one dish of food. We eat on the floor. You know, my dad always, always also at that time, we were eating on the floor, so he would, he would make more than one dish. Dr. Abdurrahman Sumayt was coming to honor his presence, all that kind of thing. And he would get extremely angry and very, very visibly angry at us. And he would say, why do we have two dishes of food here? He said, well, I just came from last week. People don't even have one dish of food. How can you give us two dishes of food? And he would get, so we got to a point where even my mom understood after a while that don't, pro, 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 you know, uh, don't make more than, don't prepare more than one dish of food. And even the one dish better not be elaborate. It better be as simple as possible because this man understands that. He feels that. And then, of course, I remember, in, you know, we'd pick him up at the airport. We'd spend time with him. I'd go with him everywhere, wherever my dad was taking him and they were together all the time then I would want to carry his bag as a sign of respect, as a sign of honor, so I would want to carry. And he would look at me very sternly as a young boy and would say to me, are you going to carry my sins for me on the day of Qiyamah as well? He said, if you're not going to do that, then leave my bag, let me carry it myself. And that taught me such an amazing lesson that even a man of his, he was still hum he still remembered his weaknesses. He understood he was a human being. He understood that he himself one day also has to carry his sins and his weaknesses. And he was trying to teach me that lesson. As well. So when I think about those kind of things, those interactions, I remember when we went in 2010 to Kuwait with my dad as well, um, uh, and we went to, 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 to see him again. At that time, he was running a research institute, and his dream, his age and his illness, he was still dreaming about what he wanted to do in Africa still. And he was telling us about his vision for what he still wants to do in Africa. He wants to, uh, he wants to create this mobile education center that can move through Africa, teaching people in Africa some of the, 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 the benefits that the Muslims in history had brought to humanity, some of the developments we had brought in science, in mathematics, in this. And he said, because if we can educate Africa about what Muslims have brought to humanity and to, and to, and to, and to the civilized world, so to speak, it will just show that it's, it's a calming effect in the water again. And that's what he, you know, and that, that, that blew me away. Even in his office, I was there in 2010 in his office, he had a wooden desk, not a wooden desk like you and I understand wooden desk. He had it patched together with nails. Somebody had like a makeshift kind of thing, not because, because he didn't want to live in excess. He wanted to live simply. In his, in his family, he taught his kids as well. He, he used to say that the, the most stingy of his kids would give half his wealth away. 
half his money. He says, most of his kids would give pretty much everything they own away to charity because that's the way he brought them up. But the most stingy of his children would give half away. I mean, when you just think about that for a second, that kind of concept. And then in Africa, he's credited with, 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 with making at least 7 million people uh, recite the Shahada over his time because he was so passionate about this. He believed that in Africa, Islam was there many, 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 many years ago. He would go to certain villages, he would tell us stories about people saying, yes, they remember there was something special about a Friday, but they couldn't remember what it was. So he kind of went down that process as well. So when you think about that kind of interaction, I was there just, uh, just to wrap up on this, on this point. I was there just a few months before he passed away again. And saw him in hospital. He was, he was terminally ill at that time. He was in hospital for two years. But so much noor on his face. So much at peace with himself. When I walked into the room, he was smiling. He was talking to me. His mom came in on a wheelchair. They brought his mom in. He started trying to sing a little song for her about how much he loves her. And this man, this great man, I just sat there looking at him with tears in my eyes, thinking what so much noor, so much he gave to the world. May Allah grant him the highest place in Jannah, inshallah. SubhanAllah, I certainly am inspired and I hope you are too. More than inspired, moved, moved by a great personality. And may Allah allow the young and the old and each and every one of us in our society to take inspiration from his life and to go out there and to be human beings, not just of talk, but human beings of action. We're going for a quick break. We'll be back just now. Africa, we are the children of...